So besides him, I guess we'll just assume this is the group we have, small group. That will give us all a chance to talk. You know, because we don't do that anyway. But uh, yeah, this, this right off the bat, we're not going to be in the book at all. Nothing underlined. Um, if you recall these, so Romans 9, 10, and 11, so we're doing chapter 9 tonight, those are the chapters that the book decided they wanted to spend one week to cover. So I had to greatly expand that. Um, so because of that, the way the book lay structures that, it, it just wasn't really conducive to the stuff that we need to talk about. Uh, so it should be good because there's a lot of Old Testament going on in these chapters. There's a lot of stuff to look up. Hopefully nothing should be quite as dense as the last half hour of last week, uh, which we talked about in depth. I think I'll cover it in about four seconds. Um, other than that, you know, we can't spend too much time there. Um, Yes, yeah, so actually this week we'll, we'll start by finishing up Romans chapter 8, because if you recall we did kind of stall out on those three verses for about half an hour. Um, I don't think there will be a ton to discuss with the rest of the chapter, but for the sake of just completion we'll read, read through the whole thing. I was about to open up in prayer, but I heard footsteps. I heard footsteps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is the group I assume we'll have for the night. So why don't we open up in prayer and get started? Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the people who are able to make it out. Uh, I just pray that even with a small group, we have a good, uh, healthy discussion that we can dig into your word in new and different ways, maybe see some things we haven't seen before, or even just be reminded of things that we already know but uh, could use more of in our lives. Uh, so I pray you be with us during this time. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so the big recap that, yeah, I'll, maybe like 10 seconds I'll give it from last week so we don't spend the whole time. When we were talking about Romans 8, 28 through 30, the result that I came to with how we're supposed to understand those things, and I made a long case for it, was basically that God has been faithful in the past and will be faithful now with the Romans in their context of suffering. Now, you may not agree with that interpretation. That's fine. I made my case for it. But at the very least, hopefully what I really did was make a case for going over the top to make sure we're taking Romans in its context and not try to bring in outside debates or theologies or things that probably wouldn't have been apparent to the Roman church. And that's where we're going to keep going tonight, because chapter 9 is another chapter where it gets people tend to pull it into other directions that I don't think the text is trying to do. So we're going to focus hard on trying to keep Romans 9 in the context that Paul is writing it in. Um, and since we're kind of starting in the like middle end of a chapter, um, since we're not really using much of the, or we're not really using the book tonight, we have no fun like opening questions. So I just want to throw it out there for a minute. Um, what have you thought of Paul's writing so far? Or first, let me ask this: How familiar were you guys with the Book of Romans before the study? Okay, we got one head shaking, so I'm going to say that's not very. <laughs> Read through it, okay? About that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what would have been your impressions, like, kind of digging in depth with it? If you knew nothing about it or you just knew a little bit, were you, is it 
different than you thought or as you've read it through before? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, do you find his repetition helpful or confusing? Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else that has kind of struck you about about studying through it so far? Uh, what have you thought about his use of the Old Testament? Do you find that adds to your understanding, or do you find that a little more difficult to track down? That was hot. Jeez. What was it? Oh, uh, what do you think of his use of the Old Testament in the letter? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, still applicable for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. What were you going to say, Mandy? Yeah, gives it a sense of continuity, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, I'm not really like trying to take us anywhere with these questions. It was just since we didn't have like a proper intro, I was like, hmm. and we have a small group. Let Let's see what we're thinking. How How we. Yeah. Okay, uh, so why don't we just jump into finishing up Romans chapter 8. Uh, I'll ask your thoughts. I don't know that we'll have a ton of diverse stuff. It's not a very difficult section. Um, but just so we can say we've read all of Romans by the end of it. So Romans 8 verse 31. After all that stuff we talked about last week, uh, encouragement and suffering, it says, what shall we say then? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. All right, that's a good, encouraging way to end that chapter. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and I think that um, that speaks more strongly, like once you've read and understood all of Romans, um, because you know opening chapters are just like here's why God shouldn't be against or shouldn't be for you. Here's why God should be against you, um, and then you get 
all the stuff about uh, justification and, and the cross and um, all this kind of stuff, and especially what we talked about last week with the idea of comfort in suffering. It's like, yeah, and he you know, kind of goes on to say, God's the one who justifies. Christ, you know, uh, he's not going to condemn you. He, he's the one who justified. So, yeah, I think that, ver- that well-known verse does get a lot more meaning once we understand the rest of the book. Anything else that jumped out at you? Yeah, absolutely. So, so just a minor detour into the problem of evil. That's that's where we're going. <laughs> well, no, it, it was kind of covered last week um, with, you know, the idea of those in the past being, uh, which uh, which was the phrase, um, the that they were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We spent a lot of time on that, and. Um, yeah, so the fact that the one who was most precious to him, he was rejected, suffered, died on a cross. Um, it is enough for the student to be as the master, the disciple to be as the master. Um, yeah, looking at the saints in the past, there should be no reason to expect really anything but those. And then Paul somehow using the logic of the cross and what we are dead to and alive to and all the things that he's talked about claims that we're more than conquerors in these things. Uh, Especially, you know, he's probably just out of one of his most recent prison stints. And, uh, yeah, the fact that he can say that is quite interesting. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so, of course, who can be against us? Um, one, I think it's, it, it's likely who can be against us in any real and lasting sense, especially when we're looking at justification. Um, you know, of course, within about 10 years, Paul's going to be put to death by Rome. Like, things can and will be against the Christian, uh, but in regard to the work that 
God and Christ and the Spirit are doing in the believer. Um, you know, he's talking about victory in the things that he's actually been called to, which is chiefly being conformed to the image of Christ, um, and then uh, the work of the gospel that God's called him to and all sorts of things like this. Uh, so it's sort of like, yeah, you can't have all these things against you, but uh, the actual thing that things that God has for the believer um, I don't think can really be thwarted. Uh, not, like None of it ends up being outside of God's allowed will for his life. Does that make sense, or is that good? Or <laughs> You zoned out a little bit? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right, so with that. I just had, um, yeah, actually my note on verse 31 was basically, if God declares you righteous, and I, I left it blank, but like, if God's the one who's declared you righteous, who could, nothing can actually stand against that. And I had 32, he gave his own son, and just wrote, rest secure. Like that was just kind of how I summed up the whole thing. Uh, but. That's good. We have a lot of thoughts on that. Let's, let's dive into Romans 9. And we should get a good amount of Old Testament in here. That should be good. I'm excited about that anyway. Uh, first five verses, Romans 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I wish that I, uh, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertained the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, who are the fathers of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. All right, quick little series of verses there, but any uh, anything that jumps out at you? Mm, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. That wouldn't have been my first thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what, and it's kind of like the plain sense of that part of the text where uh, that's what jumped out at me was like the absurd levels of compassion there that he's saying he wishes if, you know, if it were somehow possible that he would be accursed, like he would be damned, not justified if his Jewish brethren could be. Um, I don't know if I have that in me, even a little bit. Um, yeah, that'd be a tough one. That is another level. Well said. Yeah, I don't... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of compassion. Um, and then the the blessings of the Jewish people. He's kind of gone over that before. Like, 
uh, I think it was chapter three, where he's saying something about like, you know, what, is there any benefit then to the Jewish people if, you know, we're all under sin? Uh, but the, the list of benefits to the Jewish people here uh, in verses four and five, you know, they had uh, the, the adoption, like God called Israel his son, his chosen people, uh, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, that's like the, the temple worship, the service of God, uh, the promises, uh, the fathers of the faith, concerning the flesh, uh, who concerning the flesh Christ came. And then he can't help just a little like mini doxology there. Who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. Like he just kind of bursts into a little bit of written praise there. Um, but yeah, I just thought mostly of compassion and the benefits and blessings of the Jewish people. And then this is going to be relevant to the discussion we're about to get into because he's, he's lamenting over the fact that, okay, most of his Jewish brothers and sisters have not followed the Messiah. Why do you think that is? I guess there's no wrong answer here. That's probably a dangerous thing to say. But before we dig into it in the text, uh, why do you think most of the Jewish people of his day didn't follow the Messiah? Mm-hmm. Um, and with so many rules and laws and so like just it seems yeah I just think about things to, like how they are today and um, you know very um, I don't know what I'm trying to say yeah it's, a, it's an interesting religion, you know. Um, the, 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 the rules have been very intense for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Kind of stepping out of the zeitgeist of that structured system. I got gotcha. you. All right. Yes. Yes, they have. All throughout the centuries, they've been a stiff-necked people. <laughs> yeah. We're actually going to look at a passage tonight about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, leadership matters. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they were definitely looking for something different. Um, if, if, if Jesus would have come and like, defeated the Romans and all, and, you know, all these things, I guess it probably would have looked a lot, a lot differently. Yeah. You know. Would have made a cool movie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, one, one quick question. Yeah. Yeah, so I would say most of the warrior type status uh, that they expected. Um, one, it's not totally wrong, like because you can think of Christ as Lamb of God and also the one who conquered death. So, like, he definitely has a warrior king aspect to him. And then, of course, the final judgment, like, read Revelation, definitely that. Um, but also, he was going to be from the line of David. They knew that. And also just the nature of the way salvation tends to be talked about in the Old Testament. Like, 
we've said many times, a lot of where we get our salvation, like the redemption language is from the Exodus, when God, you know, defeated Egypt, who they were in bondage under, and brought them out into the promised land. Um, so, like, you have that, and then, of course, when God delivers them from uh, Babylon after they've been taken into captivity there, like, God's rescuing of his people frequently looks like this militaristic type thing, even though it's always God doing that. It's, it's never actually the Jewish people, really, like in those big scenarios. Um, so yeah, their, their, their inclinations weren't totally off. They were just really not seeing the big picture, uh, especially Isaiah's suffering servant, a lot of uh, how that gets brought in. Um, yeah, it's just a much bigger picture than, than they saw, I believe. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. In the in nine verse um, four through five, it's almost like he's saying it's not all all of these things are like in vain. Oh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and then he's going to start unpacking, like, like what's actually going on with the Jewish people now. Uh, so, so why don't we look at that? And uh, we're going to read a few verses, and I'm going to kind of ask some clarifying questions along the way as we're reading. Uh, so, okay, verse 6 kind of countering that point. He says, not as though the word of God has taken none effect. Um, okay, so remember he's talking about like why haven't the Jews followed the Messiah? It hasn't taken no effect because like he's, he's saved. Uh, For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Um, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. As this is the word of promise, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Um, okay, let's stop there without getting too far ahead of ourselves. Do we, are we familiar with this story of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac, okay. So, so he's taking a pretty interesting step here and saying that, so when he says, not, uh, they are not all Israel which are of Israel, he's starting to build a case for, uh, I guess what we'll call the remnant, and we'll, I'll leave that, but we'll, that's what he's doing. So, Okay, Abraham received the promise that we've talked about a million times over. But he says, okay, just because you're a child of Abraham doesn't mean you're a child of Abraham. So he's saying it's, it's not just that you're born of Abraham, like after the flesh, but it, it's about the, that continuing promise. Because you remember, who is Abraham's literal firstborn son? Chronologically speaking. No, that's the interesting thing. Yeah, Ishmael. So chronologically, Ishmael is born first, and yet Isaac ends up being called uh, the firstborn because that ends up being more of like a status than a chronological reality. So uh, in verse 7 when he's saying, in Isaac shall thy seed be called, he's, he's rolling back to a chapter in Genesis where he's, where God is specifying with Abraham, um, the promise isn't going to go through Ishmael, it's going to go through Isaac. He is the child of promise. Um, and then, so we're continuing on, verse 9. For, uh, I'm sorry, verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, so Isaac's kids, uh, for the children not yet being born, or yet, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. 
As it is written, Jacob I have loved, uh, but Esau have I hated. And we'll, I promise you, we'll unpack that. But what he's doing first with Isaac and Ishmael, he's setting up this standard that, um, let's see, where does it say? Um, okay, so it's not of, geez, missing the verse. Um, basically, okay, with, with Ishmael and Isaac, his point is it's not about just being of the seed of Abraham. It's not just about his uh, genetics, because Isaac comes from Abraham. Ishmael comes from Abraham. Isaac is the child of promise. So it's not about... It's not, oh yeah, children of the, uh, which are of the flesh. Okay, yeah, verse 8, that's what I was looking for. And then we'll dig into Jacob and Esau. But he's making the point with Jacob and Esau that, and if you're not familiar, so Isaac, who we just learned is the child of promise, he also has sons, they're twins, um, and even though, Esau just like kind of beats him out. So Esau is the older by, you know, minutes, I'm sure. But God tells him, or, and I guess him and his wife that the older son, who should be the one of status of honor in that culture, he will serve the younger. So you have this imbalance in the relationship with Jacob and Esau, and he said, God said this before they were even born, before they'd done any good or evil, so that it would be clear it's not of works, but of God that is calling Jacob to be the new child of promise. So with, with Isaac and Ishmael, you're saying, okay, it's not, it's not about the flesh, it's not just your lineage. With Jacob and Esau, you're saying it's, it's also not about works, that this promise of God has been passed down. Um, and again, we're looking at, it doesn't seem like it at the moment, but we're looking at why Israel, for the most part, has not followed the Messiah. And he starts making this thing about the promises of God and this will start to make sense as we uh, look a little bit further. Okay, let me ask this first. Because um, we said, okay, Paul is starting to make a point concerning why Israel has largely rejected the Messiah. Have you heard these verses used to say something different? Oh, I'm just saying, like, and you may not have. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you, the same stuff I was talking about last week, um, these verses somehow come up in the Calvinist-Arminius debate again. Um, and this is why I was telling you I was laying the groundwork last week, because it may not fully make sense to you yet where Paul's going, but he's clearly not talking about God choosing or not choosing people for salvation. Um, this, especially with uh, verse 13, where you have a, uh, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, somehow in the last 500 years or so, ever since these very particular debates have gone on, these verses have become something of God calling people and apparently like whole lineages for salvation or damnation. And like if you, if you, if you end up talking to like a really diehard like five-point Calvinist and they find out you're anything short of that, the first thing they'll say is, what do you do with Romans 9? You go, oh, you mean the verse that's talking about the 
promises passed down to Israel for the coming Messiah? Like, nothing, because that's not what that's about. Um, maybe, mercifully, you guys are not as, like, up on the debate. Beautiful, yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, um, good. So I don't need to spend too much time dismantling that then. Okay, uh, because so, but let's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, no, it's, uh, but no, let's, let's talk about, at the very least, um, I will give you, we should look at verse 13, like I was saying, uh, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, because even if, even if we're tracking on, okay, he's, he's talking about this promise of God that goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, at the very least, even, even if you're tracking with that, you get to verse 13 and you're like, what's wrong with Esau? What, what's going on here? That seems harsh. Um, he just said, like, before they were born, this, is, this was his judgment? This, this seems aggressive. Um, okay, so. Uh, so I owe a debt to... An online teacher, Mike Winger, if you ever are looking for some good, solid, biblical teaching, he's good. Even Pastor likes him. (laughs) Yep, yep. Um, So, yeah, I got a couple verses from a video of his that he just had aggregated some of the information I needed well. Okay, so this loved and hated concept. I think there's a really good case that the way it is being used here is simply not any way we would use it in English. Like we just, we wouldn't say this and I think there's really good evidence for that. Um, Hold your spot here and look with me at Luke 14. Uh, This is probably something from Jesus you're familiar with. All right, Luke fourteen twenty six. He says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You guys have heard that before or some, some variant of it? That seems like an odd thing to say because I'm pretty sure I could find many other places in Scripture where Jesus wants me to love my father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, um, and possibly even my own life, you know? Um, so I don't think Jesus is contradicting, you know, almost everything he's ever taught before. But in the context here, you have this idea of, like, okay, my... No matter what the situation is, I'm choosing Jesus, okay? I am going to choose to follow him, even at the expense, at times, of these other things. Um, So there's this idea of like, okay, what's happening here is not Jesus commanding you to hate every important person in your life. Um, It's the idea of choosing and preferring him, like he's going to be the thing that you are after as opposed to anything else. Yeah, the priority, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, so he uses it here in a way that we would clearly not. Um, You know what? It's it's a wider usage. That's um, 
Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's just a wider usage. Like, it, it's, it's this one word that we translate this way that seems to have a range of uh, just a much wider umbrella. And I, I think we'll, we can see it in the next... Hmm? Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, and I can show you, uh, so still try to keep Romans if you can, but turn to Genesis 29, uh, because there's an interesting story here that shows, um, because we have the, the Greek translation, the Septuagint of Genesis 29, we can see that the translators actually just kind of like threw us a bone because it would be really difficult to understand if they translated it the same way here that they, you know, that, that, that the Gospels did because it's the same word in the Greek. Um, okay, so Genesis 29, verse 30. Uh, so this is the story of Jacob. And Laban gave to Rachel... Oh, uh, did I... Hmm. Ah, I, I wrote that down wrong. Oh, okay, no, no, we're good, we're good. Yeah, um, okay, so verse 30. Uh, and he, Jacob, went in uh, also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him, his uncle, yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Okay, so that, that's actually all we need. You, you might know the story. Leah and Rachel are sisters. Jacob wanted to marry Rachel and married Leah by accident, <laughs> uh, by, by trickery and deceit. Um, so verse 30 shows us, and, and we knew this from the start, he loved Rachel more than Leah. That was the woman he fell in love with, he wanted to marry, and then there was a... The old switcheroo is the technical term. Um, so we know, like, okay, what is his feelings between Rachel and Leah? Well, he loved Rachel more than Leah. That's, that's the text. And then, um, so verse 31, the Lord saw that Leah was hated. Well, that seems extreme. All we knew from verse 30 was that he, he just loved Rachel more. Um, so some other translations try to soften the blow for you and will say something like Leah was unloved like or she was she was not preferred to Rachel the woman we know he was actually in love with and labored for um, and when we look at Genesis in the Greek translation which which helps us understand culturally between this and like what Jesus is saying is that's being written in Greek uh, you have the same thing of, it's, it's that, the same word for hated, where this is like not preferred, not preeminent, not the priority. Um, so, uh, and then to, to finish this off, uh, turn with me to Malachi chapter 1, because we'll actually see where Paul is getting this. Uh, so, Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. All right, Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. They shall call them, and they shall call them the borders of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified in the border of Israel. Okay, that might 
seem odd and out of place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. right, so it, it's, right, so it's clear right off the bat from the beginning of Malachi, okay, who is the message to? It's to Israel, not, not the person, not, you know, not Jacob, it's the nation of Israel, and he says, okay, well, he says, Malachi is like these court accusations back and forth between God and Israel. And God says, you know, to the nation, I have loved you. And they say, how have you loved us? He goes, okay, look at the differences here between Israel and Edom, the people of Esau. So he's, he's using, he talks about them at first like Jacob and Esau because Jacob was preferred before Esau. But then he immediately, he's going back, he's talking about the nations because he's saying, you know, he's, he's going to throw down like their, their mountains, their strongholds. It, e, e, uh, Edom thinks, oh, we're, we're going to rise, we'll rebuild. The things have been tough. We've had a hard go, but we'll come back. We'll build back better. And then he's like, no, you, this is done. You have nothing. Whereas Israel as a nation has this like, um, has this perpetual hope and reason that God is saying like, yeah, you went into captivity, you were judged, but I'll bring you back. And he's saying like, okay, like Edom, your brother, doesn't have this. Um, you think you haven't been loved? I have loved this nation in a very unique way. Um, yeah, okay, so, and all this might seem strange because we're not as, inundated with uh, especially probably some of the minor prophets as the Apostle Paul is. Um, but he's actually building a really poignant case that he's going to be making with, with Israel. Um, and this is taking so much longer than I expected. Looking at the clock, I just... I, I don't know. I don't know. No, no, not quite. <laughs> That was my fault. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that one's on me. I'll take that. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, but yeah, so we definitely don't have time to finish Romans 9. Um, but, okay, so because this, this sort of rabbit trail this in a few different places because of all the Old Testament that needed to be talked about. Um, but we can at least round off the beginning of his argument here, okay, because he... Again, talking about why has Israel as a nation mostly rejected their Messiah? Like, if anyone should accept the Jewish Messiah, it should be the Jewish people. That, that only makes sense. Um, so he's saying, okay, so just because someone was born from Abraham does not mean they are part of the promise. And he uses first... Uh, Isaac and Ishmael, even though Ishmael's name doesn't show up here, that's the story he's referencing. He says, God chose, Ish, uh, God chose Isaac for the promise. It just, it, that's what it was. Um, Ishmael actually made out pretty well in the deal, uh, because God was merciful to him and his mother. Um, but they're, they're just not the people of promise, the people that would bring out the Messiah. Okay, and then he talks about, Jacob and Esau, and how, like, with the first two, it, it wasn't about lineage. They were both sons of Abraham. One was the child of promise. Jacob and Esau had nothing to do with their works. They weren't even born yet, and God made a decision on how this promise would continue to play out. Uh, so, 
Okay, with that being said, verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Like, is he wrong to, to make these decisions? Does God forbid. Uh, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it's not of him that wills or of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. And we, like, we have an awkward amount of time left, <laughs> because I don't feel like I can do this whole section with Pharaoh justice in seven minutes. Um, well, we can at least read the text, and we'll, we'll see where it dumps us out for next week. That's fine. Okay, because remember, for God choosing, the, the promises of God, is he allowed to do that? Like, can he pick who this promise goes through? He's, so, he's shown that he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy, compassion on whom he will have compassion. Uh, verse 17, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom uh, he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Okay. Yeah, at least we can say a little bit about that. What story are we talking about here? Hardening of the heart of Pharaoh? Yes. Okay. Uh, so this is another part of the text where people tend to get funny about. Um, because, again, I think not keeping it in context... So he's already talked about how God is making these promised decisions by his own will. Like he's, he's choosing the people that he's choosing for the promises of God. And now he, he's about to talk about judgment according to God's will, uh, this judgment on Pharaoh. So tell me what you know about Pharaoh, um, anyone. What, what's his kind of like... Good guy, bad guy. Let's start simple. Bad guy? We're all good on that? It's too simple for anyone to feel uh, good about answering that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're probably the, uh, probably considered themselves the earthly manifestation of the god Horus. Um, that, that was common. So, like, when Pharaoh says, you know, you know, let my people go. And he goes, who is this Yahweh that I should, you know, to obey what he says? Like, it's one man considering himself a god, kind of like, I, I don't need to listen to this other god. I don't know him. Um, okay, so Paul's telling us that... Okay. Yeah, the, the text keeps going. I... Yeah, I'm trying to make some decisions on the fly here. Okay, so. What, okay. We agree he's a bad guy. Uh, can someone give me like his general series of events? Like, like what... Who is Pharaoh? What, what did he do besides not letting the people go? Do we have any sort of like bio on, on who this guy is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he wanted to keep the Jewish people as slaves. You remember the beginning of the book of Exodus when... There are too many Jewish people. And he goes like, man, if someone invades, these people will turn against us and can help overthrow us. So what do we need to do? Let's just kill all the newborn males, two years old and under, and have them toss them in the Nile if you, if you have to. Do whatever you need to. So he's a pretty rough guy from the start. Um, so 
all throughout the book of Exodus, well, not all throughout the book of Exodus, there's opening chapters of Exodus that deal with the Exodus, like up until chapter 15, 16 or so. You have a series of things happening where God says he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart in order that he will not let the people go. Now, people tend not to like that, like reading the text, and they go, oh, well, God hardened his heart. Did he even have any say in this matter? Like, what, what is God doing here? Um, that is not the case. So if you read those chapters of Exodus, you have God hardening Pharaoh's heart at different times. You have Pharaoh hardening his own heart more often. And then you have just like the passive, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Uh, so you have these few different situations. And what is really brought out in the text, and it comes up, I, actually I think it came up earlier in this book. Um, again, if you want to look up Mike Winger, there's a video, something called judicial hardening. It is a theological term of God, something like Pharaoh, God hardening a heart out of judgment. Okay, so I'm not able to explain this well enough. Um, okay, so in early in, in uh, probably Romans chapter 1, when we were covering the sins of the Gentiles, remember all these things were happening. They were like turning away from God. They were worshiping the creature rather than the creator. And God says, or Paul says, and because of this, like God gave them over to whatever their sins were in that particular moment. Um, you know, he, he allowed their minds to be darkened and to, to go off into these things. That is something that God is doing as judgment. Because they have gone so far in abandoning God, he goes, okay, fine, I will, I will give them over to the, the, the sins that they desire. Pharaoh, in like manner, he's already enslaving the people of God, killing the people of God, uh, considering himself a God and refusing to listen to the commands of God. And God informs Moses, I will harden his heart after these series of events. And he does this, they say it in Exodus, but in, um, oh, no, turned back too far. Um, verse 17. Uh, Romans 9, 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So, uh, I need to wrap up. I really wish I could have just had like, I wish I could have gotten through the whole chapter tonight. That would have just made this make so much more sense. I feel like I'm really leaving us just like on a, senseless cliffhanger. Um, but basically, in the book of Exodus, God basically informs Pharaoh and through Moses that like, for Pharaoh's sins, he could just kill him. Like that would be just punishment. He could just, okay, you've, you've gone far enough, you're done. But he hardens his heart and allows a series of 10 plagues to come over the land of Egypt, specifically because God says like, okay, judgment is due here. It's up to me how that judgment plays out. God has decided to judge, and instead of just getting rid of Pharaoh, he's going to display his power in might by hardening Pharaoh's heart so that God can be glorified in a specific way in this due judgment. Now you might think, Paul, why are you bringing this up? What's the point here? Okay, because we just had Paul explaining how the promises of God have been brought about by, you know, not, not based on the flesh, not based on works, but by God's will. And then he gives us an example that all of his Jewish audience would know where God's judgment is given a specific way to be displayed for a specific purpose. 
that, as the Jewish people know, sometimes the judgment of God, well, no, the judgment of God tends to be brought about in a way that brings God glory in specific ways. And that God is free, just like he was free to choose who, who these different promises went to, when judgment comes, he's free to judge how he sees fit for his glory. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it feels so ridiculous to like leave the lesson here, um, but I I have to, and I yeah. So if we can for for next week, um, chapter ten is not as dense. Doesn't mean I'll get through it because we see how this goes. But there's a chance we could finish, like get through nine, and maybe we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, just so remember for next week that Paul is building his case um, to explain why the Jewish people as a whole have largely rejected the Messiah. And he talks about the will of God in the way his promises have worked out in uh, like the, the remnant of his people and the just judgment of God on a nation, Egypt. So he's saying stuff that the Jews really like and get behind at first, you know, like, oh yeah, we, uh, you know, we're, we're way better than those, like, the Ishmaelites, those, like, the, those Arabian type people. Now nah, we're, we're better than them. We're chosen by God, you know, and Edom, like, are they even a people anymore? No, nah, we're, we're way better than them. Um, and he goes like, yeah, no, okay, you fully understand that you were chosen based on, you know, not, not just on lineage, not just on works. And then, hey, by the way, remember how an entire nation was judged according to the, their, their sins back in this way, and God chose how he was going to judge them? And I don't know that the Jewish readers fully understood what was about to come next. Uh, but if you don't know, let's leave that at like that. That's, a, that's an okay cliffhanger, leaving it like that. Um, so he's, he's starting to make a case that I think the Jewish people in this church are not going to like as much. Although if they get it, they'll, they'll get it. So I am very sorry. I'm very sorry to, to leave such a complex lesson hanging. Um, but alas, we need to be in bed before midnight. So, <laughs> all right, are, are we okay leaving it kind of kind of hanging here? Um, at least you'll be way ahead of the people who missed tonight. So that's, that's all I can say. Um, can't do enough recap for that. So, uh, yeah, okay. Why don't we close in prayer? Uh, Lord, I I thank you for your word, even when it's when it's tricky and difficult, and we have to root around for. Uh, some of the context of things. I just thank you for it that we can uh, hopefully understand it and um, at the very least have a, you know, maybe walk away with a grasp of uh, your promises and blessings and uh, your sovereignty over our lives. And uh, over the next few weeks as this picture comes together, I pray that it would help give us a sense of uh, peace or understanding about, you know, that, that you really are at work in the world and uh, your will is being accomplished even uh, if it seems like, like things are difficult or dark. Uh, so we thank you for that. Uh, we pray you'd be with us. Pray you bring us back safely next week. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.